How you doing today? Good to see you all again. Some uh, familiar faces, some that I don't know, so uh, maybe I can get to know you later. You know you're getting older when your daughter has a 41st birthday. <laughs> and um, for some of you, um, this will be a little amusing. You know you're also getting older when your son is in his third year as uh, a member of the uh, Bellwood Anna School Board. When he was a teenager, I never thought he'd be there. <laughs> Neither did you. <laughs> well, uh, I apologize this morning. I have picked up a couple of bad habits since I was here. One is the, I usually pay no attention to the clock. <laughs> when I was here, I was very conscious of the clock. Uh, found out later, found out since then that some churches uh, go a little longer than we were used to going. So I apologize in advance if it's a little long this morning. Uh, secondly, I also apologize because I, I I wrote to Pastor Killian and gave him the text for my message and title for the message this morning and tonight. And um, in the meantime, the Lord's kind of changed my mind a little bit. Is, is that okay? You won't hold that against me? Okay, so it was a good passage we read this morning, and I intended to preach on that passage, but uh, we're not going to do that today. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, we'll look at verses 9, nine and 10 as the, as the starting point for our message this morning. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. Let's bow our hearts and commit our time of study to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you today for the privilege we have to open our minds and hearts and expose them to your word. We pray that your spirit might teach us this morning the great truths that are here. Help us to um, hear what you say to us from your word. Help us to understand what the, what the passage says to us today. And then uh, may you, by your spirit, minister it to each of our hearts, and then may we each uh, allow that work there by your spirit to accomplish what it's intended to accomplish so that we might then respond to what you want in each of our hearts. And we ask that that'll be the case this morning. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're all aware, I'm sure, that mankind's greatest problem is sin. And we're aware, I'm sure, that the greatest gift that was ever given to mankind is the gift of forgiveness. This morning I want us to think about forgiveness, the courtroom and the family room. The Bible talks a lot about forgiveness, so it must be, very, must be a very real need. Everyone enters this life by coming into a world, and when we come into this world, we come into the divine courtroom of God, and there is no such thing as an innocent little child. We often say that, don't we? innocent little child. No such thing spiritually. Remember Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says, wherefore as by one man sin entered the world and death by sin so that death passed upon all men. Can you finish it? Okay, just want to see if you're still awake. And that's why Romans 3 10 through 12 says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no not one. There is none that understandeth God. There is none that seeketh after him. We are all gone out of the way. We are altogether become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. Now finish this. No, not one. So everyone enters the divine courtroom of God as guilty sinners. And try as we may, some uh, 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 men try harder than others, but try as we may, none of man's goodness or his religious 
uh, affiliation, his religiosity, or anything he can do can remedy this problem. The divine courtroom demands divine justice be carried out. God cannot ignore sin. He cannot just turn the other way. He must demand sin be paid for. And the thing that, uh, the, the, the only thing that can save mankind from this desperate situation is forgiveness. And so, since no one can pay their own sin debt, when all seems to be hopeless, into this divine courtroom comes the only one who can pay the price for sin. The only one who can pay that price and provide God's justice. That familiar passage in Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. What's the next word? But the gift of God is eternal life. Through whom? The Lord Jesus Christ. Remember in Romans 6, 5.8, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Then there's that unforgettable statement in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 20, chapter 9, verse 22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. That word remission there is the word forgiveness. So that forgiveness is what makes this greatest gift possible. It's the greatest gift of all. It enters, forgiveness enters the divine courtroom of God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and sets the condemned, guilty, captive free. And not just free, we're much more than just free. Remember first John, remember John chapter 1 verse 12, but as many as received him, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, to them gave he power to become the what? sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So mankind enters the divine courtroom of God as a guilty sinner. And when they receive the gift of redemption, forgiveness through the Lord Jesus Christ, they leave not simply free men, but sons of God. No more guilt, no more penalty. They exit the divine courtroom, think of this now, never to return. However, um, confession and repentance are necessary to receive the greatest gift of forgiveness. The church today is trying to squeeze out confession of sin, trying to squeeze out repentance from sin. But it is necessary for forgiveness to take place. And that forgiveness includes all our past sins Past sins, present sins, and future sins. Never to be charged again. Our sin is removed, Psalm 103.12 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has it been removed our transgression from us. Hebrews 10.17 puts it this way, and their sin and iniquity I will remember no more. Now where remission or forgiveness is, of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Oh my, what a magnificent truth that is. Are you so long in the Christian faith that that doesn't excite you? Every morning when I pray, I thank God the Father for loving me and sending his Son to be my Savior and redeeming me out of the courtroom of a just God. It is forgiveness of sin that comes at salvation. There was a story that appeared in the uh, appeared first in the uh, Today in the World, November tenth, nineteen ninety three. When the first missionaries came to Alberta, Canada, they were savagely opposed by a young chief of the Cree Indians. But he responded to the gospel and accepted Christ as Savior. Shortly afterward, a member of the Blackfoot tribe killed his father. And the Cree chief rode into the village where the murderer lived and demanded that he brought demanded that he be brought before him. 
confronting the guilty man, he said, you have killed my father, so now you must be my father. You shall ride my best horse. You shall wear my best clothes. In utter amazement and remorse, his enemy explained, My son, now you have killed me. What he meant, of course, was that the hate in his own heart had been completely erased by the forgiveness and kindness of the young Cree chief. You see, it is the forgiveness of God that removes us from the divine courtroom as guilty sinners never to return. Think of that. I am never going back to the courtroom of God. If you know Christ as your Savior, you will never return to his courtroom. And what happens then is what makes the gift of forgiveness so remarkable. The forgiveness of God removes us from the divine courtroom and takes us into the family room of God as sons of God. Just so we can fix our minds on this, uh, look back, if you would, please, to John chapter 1. <clears throat> I want you to see it. Uh, it's a familiar verse to you. You will recognize it, I'm sure. Uh, but I want you to see it. Sometimes seeing it is best. John 1.12. But as many as received him, that is Christ, to them gave him wash his feet. He has no part with them. What is he talking about? Um. Peter reacts in the usual Peter way. And as a result, he says to Jesus, if we were to put it in our own words, okay, don't just wash my feet. Give me a whole bath. He, he misunderstands or he's confused like so many people are today. Remember, the forgiveness of sin that takes place judicially at salvation never needs to be repeated again. And we have been redeemed, and no longer do we re-enter the courtroom because Jesus Christ paid the price in full for our redemption. But as we live now in this family room of God, as children of God, we do need to confess our sins. We do need to, uh, to come to God and repent of our sins, uh, not, not because of our standing before God, no, but because of our fellowship with God. And may I remind you of a great truth. God is not some mean, overbearing, heavenly father who grudgingly grants reluctant forgiveness, is he? Um, Psalm 86.5 says this, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. God, our Heavenly Father, is eager to forgive. He overflows in mercy. Do you see what great truth that is? Daniel understood this when he said this in Daniel 9, 9, to the Lord our God belong mercies and forgivenesses Though we have rebelled against him, mercies and forgivenesses. So we, uh, as we fellowship with God in the family room as his children, we are, we are confronted with the problem we have, but we are also comforted to know that he is a loving, eagerly forgiving Heavenly Father. So always remember, when we sin as the children of God, we, not go, we do not go back into the divine courtroom. We've been freed from that. Judicially, we are no longer guilty, no longer condemned. That is Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Now we remain in the family room, but our fellowship is affected, isn't it? This is the practical side of forgiveness. When we sin, it does not affect our relationship with God the Father. We are still sons of God. Nothing can change that relationship. What our sin as Christians affect is our fellowship with our Heavenly Father. 
I remember when I was a teen, sometimes I have to stretch my memory, although I'm finding I can remember the things back there a lot quicker than I, can. I remember what happened yesterday. Um, when I was a teen, I was not always uh, able and did not always make the right decisions. How was that for being good, kind to myself? When I was a teen, I didn't always make the right decisions. And my dad would tell me, I remember, I can remember it, hearing him say it. Uh, he says, I want you to remember who you are. First, he would say, you are not only my son. And he was the preacher, so what I did somewhat was important to him. He said, you're not only my son. He said, but you're also God's son. And yet even though I sometimes made bad decisions and sinned, I was still my father's son. Nothing changed that. But did it affect our fellowship? Did it affect how I felt when he came home? Did it affect whether or not I wanted to be around him? I think you understand it did affect that. Fellowship is broken. Later on, Peter experienced that when he denied the Lord three times, you remember. And it says when the rooster crowed the second time, Jesus looked at Peter. You remember that text in Luke 22? He looked at Peter. And what did Peter do? He went out and wept bitterly. David is probably a classic example of this relational forgiveness. You remember his sin with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband. And he cries out to God for forgiveness in Psalm 51. And he says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. What's he talking about? David had lost uh, his fellowship with God. He hadn't lost his, his, his position with God. No, that wasn't a problem, but his joy was gone. His fellowship was broken by sin. Sin does that, doesn't it? It does not affect our relation to God as far as being sons. It does not affect our peace with God that comes at salvation. That's, that's not affected by anything. Nothing can change that. Our sin debt had been, has been paid. We do not go back to the divine courtroom. What sin affects is the peace of God. We lose our settled rest. You experience this, don't you, as a Christian? You do something you shouldn't do or you don't do something you should do. You just have sort of a bowling ball in your stomach. You, you, you understand? You, know, you just, there's, a, there's something there that isn't right, and you know it. It affects the peace of God. We lose that settled rest. Our fellowship is hindered. David said this in Psalm 51, 8. Make me to hear joy and gladness. <laughs> Make me to hear joy and gladness and the, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. That's a perfect illustration, perfect way of saying how we feel and what happens when uh, we, we, we lose uh, the peace with God what Jesus is teaching Peter here in our text. Look back there again at verse 10, John 13, verse 10. Jesus said unto him, He that is washed needeth not save uh, to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. Jesus says to Peter, You're already washed. You've received judicial forgiveness. That comes by, by receiving Christ as Savior when you're redeemed. What you need now, Peter, uh, Jesus says to Peter, is a relational forgiveness. It comes by daily confession of sin. If you receive Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you, you, are you washed in the blood? Is the hymn writer correct when we sing, washed in the blood of the Lamb? Yes, we are washed in the blood. We do not need to be washed in the blood again. You just need to wash your feet as you walk through this world. 
Our position in Christ does not need to be renewed or repeated. Never changes. But as we live in this world of sin, we all are affected by that. We all do as I did and still do, make wrong decisions, wrong choices. We are affected by that. What do we do in that case? We confess our sin daily and receive forgiveness and cleansing. That's what Jesus taught his disciples, and he teaches us in his model prayer back in Matthew chapter 6 and in Luke chapter 11. Part of that model prayer is that we are to ask for daily forgiveness. That is the relational forgiveness that we need on a daily basis. As Christians, we we should desire to have a wonderful daily fellowship with our Heavenly Father. That's what 1 John 1, 9 teaches. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And even then, sometimes that passage is confused, uh, confusing to some people. Is that verse teaching that if, as it says, if we confess, is it teaching that if we do not confess, if we do not confess our sins, we are not forgiven? If I forget to confess a sin, (laughs) sometimes our forgetting is rather convenient, isn't it? If I forget, but even even just, uh, you know, uh, legitimately I, I, I forget, if I forget to confess a sin, Is it not forgiven? Sometimes it confuses people. Certainly not, it is not forgiven, because that would mean that if we fail to confess even one sin, we would be condemned forever. Remember, Christians no longer live in the divine courtroom. They have been, they have been granted judicial forgiveness for all sin, past, present, and future, once for all. By placing your faith faith in Jesus Christ, you move from the divine courtroom to the divine family room, and you're characterized as ones who uh, are daily confessing your sins, and you are daily receiving relational forgiveness and cleansing. That's what 1 John is really saying in its context. Christians are sons of God who are known as the ones who are constantly confessing their sins. That's what Christians do. When you sin and you experience the guilt of sin, that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Well, it's not so wonderful to experience. It's wonderful to have because I know when I've done something wrong and I can confess it and I can receive that forgiveness and cleansing. The word if there in 1 John 1, 9 is the word since. So since we are the ones who are confessing our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When Christians refuse to confess their sin and receive daily forgiveness, what happens? You refuse to do that. Your fellowship is affected and you lose the joy of your salvation. You know what? Over the years I could tell when people were refusing to do that because you'd you'd see them and you know, can you? You'd see them and you could tell. How are you doing? I'm okay. I'm doing good. Can we hide that usually? Not too well. Now, there's another practical application to this relational forgiveness. Remember when Jesus was teaching his disciples to pray in Matthew 6 and Luke 11, he said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Remember the, remember the verse? He was simply teaching them and us that we are to forgive those who f- sin against us. Oh, now I've stopped preaching and started meddling. Hmm? 
And while it would seem that Christians of all people should be willing to forgive those who sin against them, I shall tell you, we sometimes are very unwilling to do that, aren't we? Many Christians, it seems, uh, uh, the, the most difficult words they have to say or I forgive you or I am sorry I was wrong please forgive me some of the greatest conflicts in the Christian life are caused by lack of, of willingness on the part of Christians to forgive others we have received the greatest forgiveness of all, judicial forgiveness. That took us out of the courtroom of God and placed us into the family room as sons. We know what forgiveness is, and yet we have such a hard time forgiving others. I've seen families hurt by that. I've seen churches and relationships destroyed because Christians would not forgive someone else. Even Peter struggled with this. Look back, if you would. I will have you do that, just, just so you don't get sort of sluggish. Look back at Matthew 18 for a minute. Verse 21, then came Peter to him and said, are you there? Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? See, the rabbis taught that you were to forgive someone three times and then you could lower the boom. Or you could, as we would say, get even. Peter says, I've taken the teaching of the rabbis, which is three, and I've doubled it, and then I've just added one for good measure. Wow, what a great guy I am. We would probably say something like this if we were in that situation. How long do I have to put up with this person? Obviously, they don't understand and have a clue about being accountable for their actions. Then in verse 22, Jesus said unto him that very difficult verse. He says to him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. How's your math? 490. Peter has a short memory at this time because uh, it, just a short time prior to this Jesus taught them back in Matthew 6 how to pray forgive us our debts as we forgive those who trespass against us forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors here Jesus taught his disciples that they were to be forgiving because the father is a forgiving father Christians of all people should be known for their forgiving attitude, their forgiveness. And the reason is obvious, isn't it? Why should we be known for our forgiving attitude? Because the ultimate forgiveness from our Father is ours. It's, one the, it's been one of the greatest problems within the church among individual Christians is their unwillingness to forgive each other. Nothing is more unchristlike than to have Christians who are refusing to forgive. Remember now, when Christians uh, sin, they do not lose their salvation. No, no, uh, uh, they, 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 uh, they confess their sins. What they lose is their joy, is their fellowship in salvation by forfeiting the sweet, joyful oneness we have with the Heavenly Father. Not only do we lose our joy, but our testimony is gone too. Hmm? Are we the only one who knows we're not forgiving? No, other people know as well. It isn't long till people find out 
and then uh, we who are supposed to be Christians are not being forgiving, and now everybody knows, and our testimony is gone. It's amazing that Christians would willfully choose to live with accumulated guilt, accumulated dirt on their feet as they walk through this life because they refuse to confess their sins and receive cleansing. And it's also difficult to believe that Christians have such a difficult time forgiving others. Because refusing to forgive creates bitterness, and bitterness eats like a cancer, and it produces anger, and anger produces vengeance. Bitterness is a byproduct and destroys friendship and relationships and homes and families and churches and a lot more. It takes virtue and courage to forgive. More than that, the ability to forgive only comes from God. If we want to call, if we want to call ourselves Christians, then we must always be willing and ready to forgive. That's the relational forgiveness of the family room. Which room are you living in this morning? In his book, Putting Your Past Behind You, Finding Hope for Life's Deepest um, Hurts, Erwin W. Lutzer relates this story. In the 14th century, Robert Bruce of Scotland was leading his men in battle against Scotland's in, to gain Scotland's independence from England. Near the end of the conflict, the English wanted to capture Robert Bruce to keep him from the Scottish crown. So they put his own bloodhounds on his trail. When the bloodhounds got close, Robert Bruce could hear their baying. He replied, uh, his attendant said, we, we are done for. They're on your trail and they will reveal your hiding place. Bruce replied, it's all right. Then he headed for the stream that flowed through the forest. He plunged in and waded upstream for some distance. And when he came out the other side on the bank, he was in the depths of the forest. Within minutes, the hounds tracing their master's step came to the bank of the stream where he entered. But they went no further. The English soldiers urged them on, but the trail was broken. The stream had carried the scent away. A short time later, the crown of Scotland rested on the head of Robert Bruce. You see, the memory of our sins prodded on by Satan can be like those baying dogs. But the stream flows red with the blood of God's own Son. And by grace through faith, we are safe. No sin hound can touch us. The trail is broken by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Someone once said the purpose of the cross is to repair the irreparable. Which room are you living in today? Are you still living in the con as a condemned sinner in the divine courtroom of God? If you are, you can be pardoned. You can receive the once for all judicial forgiveness. You just need to recognize and admit your hopeless sinning condition and repent and come to Christ for salvation and receive forgiveness. If you have received that judicial forgiveness and have moved out of the divine courtroom and are now a forgiven sinner who is in the family room of God as a son of God, 
Are you daily confessing your sin to God and receiving forgiveness and cleansing and the cleansing that restores your joy of salvation? Are you daily forgiving others who sin against you? If not, simply need to go to Jesus Christ, go to your heavenly Father, allow him to wash your dirty feet and restore your fellowship. Forgiveness, what a glorious gift from God. But it's not a... It's, it's not enough only to know about forgiveness. It's not enough to understand forgiveness. It's not enough to just receive forgiveness. We need to have the commitment to practice it in our lives every day. I trust that just has been a, this has just been a, a, a simple reminder to you of where you used to be, maybe where you are now, where you can go from and into another room. Hopefully that's where you live today. The courtroom of just God from there to the family room of a heavenly father. Let's bow our hearts together. Father, we thank you today for the great privilege you've given us just to be reminded of the great truth in your word of forgiveness. It's more than just a great truth. It's a wonderful gift. And we pray this morning that everyone here has received Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior and has moved out of the judicial courtroom of a holy God and has moved into the family room the loving Heavenly Father. Help us to understand where our need is. Help us to understand where our hearts are and help us to respond to the working of your spirit in each of our hearts today. We love you. Thank you for loving us. Loving us enough to send your son to be our savior. Thank you for sending your spirit to bring the truth to us and open our hearts and minds to the truth of the gospel and draw us to a saving knowledge of Christ and then take up residence in us, helping us to live in obedience to you. What a marvelous work you've done for all of us. Help us never to take that for granted. Thank you today. We love you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray.